Uh, hello all, welcome to the, today's discussion and we've got uh, Chinmay and Makaran with us again and we're talking about uh, warm up and cool down. So Chinmay and Makaran, both of them are uh, national level cyclists and uh, uh, they represent Maharashtra at the nationals. Uh, so, and sorry, Chinmay is a USA cycling level 3 coach as well as, as, well as a personal trainer. And uh, let's let's start with the science behind warm up. Yeah. So why do we actually need to warm up uh, before riding or you know uh, racing? The definition of warm up doesn't really go beyond something that's complicated. It's pretty simple. It's just basically physiological and psychological preparedness for a competition or a training session that lies ahead of you. So basically, warm up also helps you to reduce the injuries that. Uh, that can happen if you don't warm up or well before starting any workout or a race. So it helps us in uh, increasing the flexibility of the muscles and also the increase also increase the blood flow right. in our whole body. And uh, there are different types of warm up. So basically, the warm up can be uh, divided into a passive warm up or an active warm up. Uh, what we you know athletes do is. We use as active warm up more than obviously yeah. than passive warm up. But let's just go through uh, some examples of both. Uh, for passive warm up, for me is you know just uh, taking a hot shower, you know, you know to warm your body up. Uh, do, you, do you can you think of any other examples uh, of this here? So passive warm up, the other examples can be like having a massage. Okay. And basically, it is warming up your or increasing the temperature of your body by external means right that's perfect yeah and it not many athletes prefer that but the uh, athletes with some disability can prefer having an ex passive warm up and then active warm up is obviously what you do on your bike or just before your run uh, one thing if you don't mind me adding is Passive warm ups in at least our conditions, and I'm talking about Pune and probably the rest of Maharashtra, is they're not particularly necessary because uh, I mean, a passive warm up can be anything that ranges from, as you said, taking a hot shower to literally sitting in a sauna. And we don't need them unless we're in incredibly cold conditions where you actually need to do something like this before performing an active warm up where you get onto the turbo and start riding, or you head out on the road and start riding. There's that and there's also a major, major risk of dehydration. Yeah. Because when you do passive warm up, you, 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 if you decide to sit in a sauna or something of that sort, you obviously tend to sweat quite a bit. And it, it's, it's a lot easier to under fuel than it is to over fuel. So you always have that little risk of losing more water than you actually put in, which can obviously impair your race performance or your training performance. And uh, active warm up is obviously what you do on your bike uh, yeah. before a ride or before a race. Uh, then there's something called stretching. Uh, we are going to talk about it a bit. Uh, we are going to ask if it's you know good to stretch during your warm up or during your cool down. Uh, but but let's just get into the basics of what stretching is. is. Okay, so uh, let's put it this way, right? Stretching is I'll divide it into two very simple parts. The first is dynamic stretching. The second is static stretching. Dynamic is when you move around, and static is when you hold a particular position. So if I decide to maybe stretch my, if I want to stretch my chest, for example. Then I'm going to move it around. This is a dynamic stretch. This is something that I would want to perform before a session or before a race. And then the static stretch, which is something I would want to perform after. Again, a very controversial top topic, but static stretching is usually put on post sessions. Is something where I want to hold this, so maybe take both my arms behind and just hold it like this. That's that's what a static stretch is. And obviously, stretching is more uh, used for mobility of your joints and. Yeah. Uh, the ligaments. Uh, I would like to add something on that. Uh, stretching is something that is specific, it's more specific to muscles and it's more specific to flexibility. Mobility is a, it's, it's, it's sort of the other side of the coin but it's, it's not the same paradigm. Mobility is the range of motion of your joints and flexibility is 
I, uh, flexibility, I think would, would, it would be fair to say the range of motion of your muscles. Right. Yeah. Let's start with warm up. So let's move on to the actual science behind warm up. So what happens uh, when you start a warm up? So basically what warm up does is uh, uh, it enables oxygen to travel at much higher volume than normal and also supplies uh, adequate flow of blood to the whole body. Yeah, um, another point I, I would like to touch on the cover is, is the point that is actually neglected by a lot of people when they talk about warming up is the, the psychological aspect of it, the mental preparation kind of part of it, which it's basically your mind telling your body that, okay, the next 40 kilometers I need to go for it, yes, or for the next 100, 120 kilometers of the road race, my heart rate is going to be super high, and you tend to visualize that effort so that sort of helps your mind. You know exactly where you are in terms of how you feel, and of course, there's the other factors to it that Makan just said, and also that whenever you warm up, you obviously ramp up. You never start your warm up. You never start anything with with a thousand watt sprint, right? You obviously ramp up. You begin in the lower end of zone one. You start to build up to whatever zone based on what your workout is or based on which race you have. But uh, since it's a ramp up, since you are you start easy and then you build up into the effort, it, it obviously provides blood to the muscles, but because it's a ramp you tend to well it's it's a, the resistance on the muscles and the joints is a lot lower when you're actually pushing in competition or in training and that obviously helps the risk it, it prevents the risk of any form of injuries. Right, and uh, let's look at warm up from different perspectives of uh, racing as well as riding and different types of races and different types of tracks. So, let's start with uh, let's consider uh, we have uh, like endurance ride, like 200 km VRA. How would you so when is the best time to warm up for that and uh, how would you warm up for that? So, basically, for a VRM. No, a longer warm up would not be recommended because they what they have the distance they have in front of them is already because they have to ride at a constant speed right so a short 5 minute or 10 minute spin just to wake up the legs that would be fine according to me you can just warm up on your bike once the PRM starts as well yeah, yeah. yeah. I was thinking yeah. Like, I wouldn't have <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's pretty uh, Pretty basic, I guess. Uh, and having a different warm up session just before a VRM would just uh, add up the fatigue for the, the fatigue yeah. in your muscles. And uh, if it's a short, intense ride, so maybe a climbing session, yeah. uh, say a 30, 30 minute climbing session, or maybe a 30 minute climbing segment, how do you uh, warm up for that? So that's when things get tricky. That's when it's if you're talking about something like 30 kilometer climbing time trial, then a time trial, I it's in my opinion, a warm up in time trial means a lot more attention. And if you talk to or if you listen to the interviews of some of the most legendary time tri trials there are, take Tony Martin or Anime Van Bluten and you ask them how they warm up and how much time they took to master the warm up, they will tell you that it took me years and years and maybe even decades to figure out exactly what fits for me. So, and that's the thing with so many things in endurance sports that you there is no one thing, there is no one size fits all. If, even with something like a warm up, even with something like a cool down, there are five things or ten things that you can do and you have to constantly try each one of them to find that fits, find what fits. Now, with regards to a 30 minute, uh, a 30 minute climbing time trial, you you, uh, you start off, at least this is this is a protocol that I would follow, there's a lot of different factors to it. What I would do is I would start off in the lower end of my lower end of zone 1, then build into it, spend some time in zone 2, then spend a couple of minutes in zone 3 and zone 4, then some time off, a couple of activation sprints, some time off again, have maybe in, in that time off after the activation sprints, maybe have a gel or a couple of dry food, something to give me that little energy boost. and. That's 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 when my effort, that's when my climbing ID starts. But again, over here, based on what I've said, there are a lot of things to factor in. This is assuming that I would be doing it on local climbing point. But if I was doing it in somewhere in the Himalayas where the temperatures are 
zero to five, zero to ten, sometimes sub zero, then I would need a much longer warm up, and in some cases, a passive warm up as well. So maybe we should also explain what uh, activation sprints are. Okay, yeah. yeah. So activation sprints basically they are incredibly short bursts of yeah. high cadence sprints where you don't you don't you obviously don't reach your it's not a, a warm up is not a personal best setting where you don't want to get your you don't want to get your five second PB or your twenty second PB on a warm up. But it's it's something that you want to do which doesn't really induce a lot of fatigue in muscles but uh, it activates the muscles to make sure that the muscle is ready for the effort that lies ahead. Yes, and uh, I read it somewhere that uh, the amount of uh, warm up that you do is inversely proportional to you know the time of the race or maybe the time of the ride. So if it's a shorter race but a really uh, fast one, then the warm up needs to be longer yeah. and that intense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but if it's a long ride, then the warm up should be just a basic warm up, like mm -hmm. 5 minutes or 10 minutes warm up. Well, that should be sufficient. Depends. There's, there's a lot of factors to that yeah. as well. So, if, if for example, like there was a race called the Shayate Classic, which Siddharth so organized, the Shayate Classic, and, I, um, and it was a 200 kilometer race. And yeah. I think that was that was the longest ride I've ever done with the most amount of elevation. I think that had 3,600 meters or less. 3,000, yeah. yeah. And in that race, uh, and this is just to prove that how variable warm up can be. That I showed up to the start line, no warm up whatsoever. Yeah. And uh, I was I was on somebody's wheel, and that guy was lightning fast, right? I was on somebody's wheel, and the race started supremely fast. I got dropped, and it, I I it felt like my muscles had no glycogen whatsoever to provide me with energy for the for the rest of the 192 kilometers after the first 8 kilometer climb. I reached the top completely drained. And then I had to tell myself, okay, I. It wasn't particularly a decision of not warming up. It was other factors that couldn't let me warm up. But um, well, it's again variables. For a ride like that, which starts supremely fast, I would, even though it, it would be a 200k, I would still prefer at least a 20 to 25 minute warm up just to get the legs spinning and to make sure I don't get dropped and run out of glycogen by the end. Yeah. <laughs> and then towards honestly towards the rest of the 192 kilometers, I was just like, can't. <laughs> mm, bananas weren't helping, right? Like, nothing was helping. It all depends on the type of the yeah. ride, yeah. ride yeah. and this ride. And uh, yeah, so let's move on to the methods of warming up. So let's stick with uh, maybe two or three different types of rides and races that we do over here. So the first type would be a long endurance ride. Uh, Long in this sense is 100k. Uh, then the second would be a 100k race, and uh, maybe a third one will be a grit race. Okay. So let's discuss those and the methods for warming up for each and every one of those races. So starting off with firstly with the grit races. Okay. So the grit races are short and intense, yep. and the format is pretty simple that you just give 100% from the flag off. Yes. So the warm up needed for that kind of races is short sprints burst, sprint bursts as Shinma explained yep. and uh, 35 to 40 minutes of warm up would be preferable for a crit race. Right. With so uh, imagine there is a crit race uh, that is going on uh, later in the evening Yeah. and it is a 35 minutes plus one lap race. Yeah. What would be your precise form for that race? So precise warm up uh, for me, I would be doing a build up from a zone build up, uh, five minute build up okay. from zone one to zone four, okay. and then a small five small sprints okay. of ten S seconds. Sorry, so when you say five minute build up from zone one to zone four, that means that five minutes in each zone, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Not not five minute, one minute in each zone for one five minutes. minutes. Okay. So one minute in each zone for five minutes. So zone one, zone two, zone three, zone three point five, and zone four. So and a five and five into ten seconds short sprints, okay. uh, which will just help me wake wake up my legs and just tell me that the race is going to start fast and we are ready for it. And would that be the same for you? Mm, somewhere in the middle. For me, it would it would be probably a forty-five minute warm up where. 
I uh, where I would spend the first 20 minutes just spinning into zone one. <laughs> then, <clears throat> then I would probably spend the next five to ten minutes building up into zone two, and that's when I would, as Makaram explained, five minute chunk. I would add that five minute chunk after the first 25 minutes, and then after that I'm going to spend the next five minute chunk uh, doing three spins. <clears throat> Each of them maybe eight to ten seconds again just to wake up the fast twitch muscles, and then a five minute cool down ish period where I have a gel or whatever it is that I consume for this. Yeah, so a transition phase will be there and between your warm up and at the actual race flag yeah, like off. Yeah, yeah. How do you maintain your heart rate during this time? So maintaining heart rate is not that important during this time. Okay. So because we have already done the work before. Right. Just keeping up your energy levels and keeping yourself hydrated enough right. for the race start of the race. Because you have just you have just kept your body ready for that uh, fast start of the race. Okay. So you don't. Yeah. Fair enough. And let's move on to the next type of race, which would be a 100 kilometer road race. Uh, would the warm up be same for a road race as for a quick race, or would it be a bit different? Uh, it would be a lot different for a 100 kilometer road race because the race would start fast, but not as fast as a crit race okay. because because every rider in the peloton knows that I have 100 kilometers in front of me unless and until it is Eddie Merckx <laughs> who will just start from the flag up till the end of the race or cocaine okay, <laughs> yeah. for us so a short a short warm up of 20 to 30 minutes would be fine uh, then again it's uh, a personal choice if you need short sprint sessions or a build up just to wake up your body or right. a easy spin would do the job for you. Yeah, no, the same thing anyway. I would just, I would just subtract 10 minutes of the entire zone 1 chunk from the yeah. first 25 minutes. Fair enough. And uh, just a 100 km ride, it's not a race, you are just riding uh, with your friends. And how do you warm up for that? Do you actually warm up for that? No, <laughs> that the warm up would be just, just sit on your bike, start pedaling. Sit on your bike, start pedaling. Easy pedaling, yeah, just. The warm up is the ride from home to Chandigarh. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think are the uh, factors that affect uh, warm ups? So, one point I would love to share about is the external factors for for warming up. Uh, how is the weather on that day? Uh, if it's uh, summer and the race is in the summer, summer time, a longer warm up can lead to dehydration and energy loss. Whereas, if the race is during the winter times you might need to add 10 minutes extra to your warm-up just to prepare your body for the race. So <clears throat> the warm, warm-up is also largely dependent on external factors as well. Yeah. Uh, another point to that is, I think this has, this has kind of two sub-points to it. The first one I would want to tap on is how the rider is feeling on that day. So I've had a lot of days where I feel like I feel hot on the bike where I get on the bike and I feel like okay, this is this is not how I feel. Maybe uh, maybe I didn't maybe I didn't sleep well last night or it's just any reason that can make my make my entire body feel completely cramped up. And when I sit on the bike it just feels like my cadence is not going up and my heart rate is not very elastic and I just I don't feel like I can push and it's not it's not that psychological readiness to go ahead or to proceed in the warm up. So in a case like that, what I would do is I would just add a lot more time into the warm-up. And when I say a lot more time, I'm not I don't mean you know pushing pushing out like 400 watt efforts or something like that. I'm just talking about maybe another 10 to 15 minute chunk in zone one. Just just spinning till I feel better, until I feel a lot readier to be able to progress into the next one. I, I, I do spend a lot of time in zone one in my warm-up. So uh, there's that factor to it and another factor to it is the fitness level of rider, because the fitter you get, the more time it takes. I wouldn't say effort, but the more time it takes for a rider to warm up. I mean, I'll give you an example, right? Uh, recently, because of the because of the coronavirus, the, the Tour de Flanders was cancelled, and because of that, we had to watch a uh, virtual Tour de Flanders. So we had, I think, what six, six, eight riders taking part eight in that, riders. and there were eight riders taking part in that, and Renko Evanpour was one of them. He's a he's a twenty-year-old guy from Belgium, and he had for that race, and that race was 40 kilometers, 45 kilometers, something around that. Yeah. Definitely not a long way out of the And 
and for <laughs> that race he had done a two hour warm up and bear in mind we are talking about the national european time uh, the european time trial champion yeah, second in the world so yeah that's incredibly fit guy and clearly someone who needs to was to warm up for that race and i think he finished third on that race yeah gba yeah. 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 let's move on to the cool down part of uh, the discussion so what is cool down and why is it actually important uh so, go for it yeah so cool down would be the first a uh, step to prepare your body for the next session or the race you have ahead of you and uh, it is actually bringing your body to the pre exercise state and because if yeah okay. yeah uh, there's a there's a really good thing which uh, which goes like this right uh, the the beginning of your next training session or your next race begins at the end of this training session of this race at the end of this race so uh, what that basically means is that when you're done with any form of a session be it apart from recovery right? if you're maybe at the end of a really hard interval session or at the end of a race so you could really push quite hard you need you need to ramp down and cool down is not it's not as it's not given that much importance unfortunately it should be but it's not given as much importance in the warm up where you ramp up in a warm up you ramp down in a cool down and in in a cool down it's it's basically it's basically an incredibly mild exercise where you just let the legs spin for maybe not even not even uh, less than 50% of your effort maybe yeah. 40 to 50% of your effort you just take it easy sometimes even lesser it allows your respiratory system your metabolic system and your circulatory system to get back to normal and if you don't warm up you definitely risk uh, blood pooling in the legs So it's also something that helps you sort of flush the lactic acid yeah. out of the legs and helps you recover for the next session. And that is that is the that is the work part of it. When you come to the nutritional part of it, in the warm up, obviously when you exercise, you lose a lot of fluids. You always need to keep yourself topped up. But in the end of the race, you don't really have time to get a bottle out and start sipping water, right? Because most of the most of the people just take their bottles out and throw it on the road because they they need to save that weight. So. when the cool down you you need to replace the fluids that you lost and a lot of people they tend a lot of cyclists they tend to lose two maybe sometimes even three liters and you know, up towards the end of the race when you're when it's when they're performing intense exercise so you need to replace the lost fluids and some quick release carbs to restore your glycogen index and also some protein to repair the muscle damage yep and uh, where do stretches come in So as you explained that uh, there's two types of stretching. Uh, one is static and the other one is uh, dynamic stretching. Uh, for me, uh, one of my, <coughs> one of part of my uh, cool down process uh, is having stretches. Like uh, it, it, it's mostly uh, related to you know the lower body uh, stretches for me as well as the back. Uh, but I just find it that uh, stretching helps me a lot, uh, you know, to recover my muscles. So what do you what do you think about that? So stretching for me is uh, post ride. Yes. And even not immediately after the post ride, but my stretching session is uh, after the dinner, just before going to bed. So just foam rolling and doing some stretches, and then going to bed and prepare myself for the next day. Yeah. Uh, again, I will. As I mentioned earlier, it's. It's a very, very controversial topic, and a lot of people are going to disagree with me when I say this. But uh, stretching is—it's given more importance than it deserves. When people say that, I mean, of course, it's you know also in some cases it's given less importance than it deserves. But again, as I mentioned earlier, in endurance sports, there's ten different things that you can do. You have to find what fits you, and it's to an extent, it's almost about endurance. when if you there are uh, there are studies which say that stretching does more harm than good which surprised me but the more i read about it the more i realize that okay there's a high possibility that's that's the case there's a high possibility that's not the case so the idea to cool down is something it's not something that i can tell anybody it's not something that i can say okay you are your power numbers this is the ideal cool down period no that's that's not how it works it's something that you're going to have to figure out yourself 
and it's not something that your coach can tell you either. It's it's all about you listening to your body. So in my case, what I do is <coughs> I I have <coughs> I have a whole different session. I have a whole different recovery session. This recovery session goes in three phases. Right, the first is mobility. I spend at least 15 minutes mobilizing each and every joint of a joint of mine, especially working on the hips. The hip flexors, in the case of cyclists, they, if you notice cyclists have this thing called an anterior pelvic tilt, which basically means that the front end of your pelvis is lower than the back end of your pelvis. And that's because when we ride, our hip flexors are loaded a lot. So a mobility session to have a little extra importance on the hips, then we move to foam rolling, foam rolling all of the muscle groups in the legs and the lower body, some of the upper body, and then comes the stretching part of it right after the foam rolling. That's something that I incorporate twice a week and that's something that works for me. So for some people it might not work at all, for some people you might have to do it seven days a week. Yeah, so for me, uh, especially I've got an example when you said that stretching could uh, do much more harm than it's useful. So, uh, there was one rider who uh, I was crewing in DC and we stretched in between uh, when he was riding. So, he had already completed around 300 kilometers. Uh, we stretched his uh, lower body and his hamstrings just snapped. Snapped? Wow. Snapped right there. So, yeah. unfortunately, he had to uh, quit, quit the race. That's a but, yeah. yeah. For me, uh, if it's a short ride, like 50 or 100k ride, I definitely uh, do some sort of stretching. Uh, not not uh, particularly lower body stretching, but uh, especially for my uh, back. So my neck muscles, uh, thoracic, uh, thoracic uh, spine, as well as uh, lower lumbar spines. So that those muscles that are supporting uh, you know these spines, I definitely uh, work on those. Just the reason being, uh, we are when we are cycling, we are hunched over like in this position for a long time, and uh, after that, my muscles tend to back muscles tend to you know just uh, uh, yeah. I mean they, they are just stiff after that, and because of the stiff muscles, uh, I tend to get a headache, uh, which which lasts a whole day. Uh, so that's the reason why I tend to you know stretch my. Uh, back muscles uh, after every ride. So, uh, <clears throat> I think one of the most important creatures on this planet that would need a chiropractor is a cyclist. <laughs> because it's it's such a, it's a sport which works on your anterior body so much more than it does on the posterior chain of the body. And although when, if you, if you have kids of course, although in the, in the stroke from the 6 o'clock to the 12 o'clock position, uh, where you're actually pulling up, you do tend to involve your hamstrings and your hips. It's it's definitely not as much as your quads, that is your thighs, the frontal side of the leg. And the most dominant muscle when you're cycling is a muscle called the vastus lateralis, which is located in the quads. It's the lateral muscle of the quads, which starts somewhere in the middle and extends all the way to the IT band and a little beyond that. So uh, there's that. There's of course the hip flexors that I mean that keep loading and something that Something that I, I focus particularly on is my pectoral mind, which is the outside of the chest. Because when you're sitting in this position, it's not just the back, but it's also these muscles that are getting loaded, loaded. They, Your shoulders almost act as stabilizers, so those get really loaded as well. So that's something that I tend to focus on. So something as simple as a golf ball or a hard tennis ball. You take that, you either do this against a wall or you press it against your shoulder. It's going to hurt like crazy, but it works like a charm. You're going to feel a lot better the next time you ride. Obviously, it's going to hurt while you're doing it. It's going to hurt maybe a little bit after you're doing it, but it's definitely going to work like a charm. And cycling is a sport where if you don't work to counter the imbalances, you're definitely going to end up with some of the other issues later in your life. That's for sure. You can take my word for it. But there's there's a lot of things you can do to counter that imbalance. So. Uh, as I said, foam rolling is one of them, uh, mobility training is one of them, stretching is one of them, there's, as I said, there's 10 things that you can do, but also a frequent visit to the chiropractor or the physiotherapist because not every cyclist has adequate knowledge or enough knowledge to know, to know exactly what or where their body is at 
nobody exactly knows what the state of their body is. Recently, I, I encountered a bit of mobility issue in my shoulder and I had to see the chiropractor for it. I thought it was only a grade 1 sprain in my posterior deltoid, which is the back side of the shoulder. But then I realized that in my thoracic spine, all the way from T5 to T8, there was a little bit of a kink. Which basically means that my vertebrae over at T5 to T8, they were tilted to the side. So we had to release the infrasonatus on my left scapula. We had to do a whole host of other things just to prevent that one imbalance that could lead to something incredibly dangerous if it had not come, if, if we hadn't encountered that. So yeah, it's not just about being fit on the bike, it's about having a healthy life in general because that in turn is going to support your cycle. Okay, and uh, do we have any tips for all our viewers? So one tip I would love to share is that always keep a check on your hydration levels while warming up before a race or uh, just a power test or a hard ride because you do not want to dehydrate yourself before carrying out uh, such intense efforts. Yeah, uh, I, I, would, I would like to say this, the principle of individuality. You have to know that everyone's different. You have to know that what works for somebody might not work for somebody else. If Makran does 5 by 10 second sprints to activate his legs, I do 3 by 8. Because that's what I think works for me. So it's, it's incredibly different. There's so many things that you need to consider. There are so many experiments that you need to do. And these experiments, another sub to that tip, is they should be carried out in training. Yeah. Or in your less important local community races. Never experiment at a big race. Never experiment. If, if maybe a community race, you think something should work for you, then that's what that's you try it out. But if you show up at the Asian Championships, trying out a new gel that doesn't really agree with you, then bad. But again, if you're at the Asian Championships, you definitely have that level of knowledge to not experiment. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, are there any uh, general tips that? you know, any recreational cyclist uh, would be able to follow to get a basic warm-up done? Uh, so, for a recreational cyclist, a basic warm-up and a small build-up of 3 minutes and just ramping up their heart rate till zone 3 would be fine and just adding small 1 or 2 based on what they are comfortable with, 8 second sprint, short sprints. Yeah. yeah. If you are a recreational rider, you don't really need to ponder over something yeah. like much. Because if you're doing it recreationally, you're most likely doing it not for competitive purpose, but just to have fun with I mean, that is all of us, but uh, we like to keep the competitive aspect on very high level. Yeah. yeah, and then, uh, you know, any interesting sources of information uh, that people might be able to read from, uh, especially in regards with warming up and cooling down? Uh, interesting sources. The first one would be if you have a coach, then he's the best source you can have. <laughs> and the other I can, which I can uh, suggest, our trainer road ha has some uh, good sources where you can gain some knowledge through it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, a recommended read to a lot of people is Joe Flavor's Bible. That is. Yeah. Uh, You've read that book? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a lovely book. A lot of information. It's literally the Bible because it has everything. Yeah. So cycling Bible. Definitely you must read by Joe Freer. Yeah.